uh, magnetic reconnection and particle acceleration. I'm not going to explain all those observations we heard this morning. Um, and don't worry if you don't know about magnetic reconnection. I'm going to try to tell you what it is. <clears throat> okay, so one thing, um, I've been going to meetings similar to this for a number of years and there's a lot more interest in magnetic reconnection than there used to be and there's a number of different areas where it's People think it could be important, of course, solar flares and pulsar magnetospheres, AGNs and radio lobes, perhaps gamma ray bursts, and also magnetar flares. So there's a lot of different areas where re magnetic reconnection is believed to be important. Okay, so the source of energy is the reverse magnetic field. Reverse magnetic field, so you've got a vector field here and you can imagine that vector field simply annihilating. But the question is, how does that actually happen in a plasma system? So I'm going to try to explain this to you. And to do it, I'm going to go back to a very simple picture. And that is, what happens to a squashed magnetic flux bubble? So I have a flux bubble here with magnetic field lines like this. It's squashed so that W is much less than L. And because Magnetic fields have tension in them. There's a tension here which is stronger than the other sides. So this wants to become round. And in becoming round, there's a couple of conservation laws because this is basically ideal behavior. Uh, one is the magnetic flux. So you integrate the magnetic flux. Same there as there. And this is nearly incompressible. So the area here is very approximately the area there. Put those two together and you can calculate the final magnetic energy here compared to here, and it turns out it's the width over the length times the initial energy. And to the extent that W is much smaller than L, um, the final energy is much smaller than the initial energy. So in relaxing a squash flux bubble, you release most of the magnetic energy. And once that's clear to you, then you can understand magnetic reconnection. Okay, so what happens to that magnetic energy when you go from here to here? Um, well, you just turn it into flow energy. So set 1 half rho v squared is v squared over 8 pi, and you get a velocity, which is the alphane speed, and a characteristic time, which is the, alpha, uh, the alphane transit time, the length over the alphane speed. And it turns out this time is typically much shorter than the energy release times they see in nature. Okay, so now we're ready to find out what reconnection is. So here we have a reverse magnetic field like this. By some magic, I break this field line and cross-connect it with one here. So I produce a reconnected field line looks like this and like this. And you see that this reconnected field line is exactly half of the squash bubble that I showed you before. And that means that this field line, because of the tension here, wants to become round. And the only way it can do that is to expand outwards like a slingshot. So you've got a slingshot going to the right and a slingshot going to the left. So you have these, and they go out, of course, at the alphane speeds. OK, so what do you have? You've got flow going like this. What happens in the middle? The pressure drops. And the pressure dropping pulls in field lines from the top and the bottom and they magically cross-connect again. So this whole thing is a self-driven process. That's what magnetic reconnection is. Um, dissipation is required to break field lines, and this can arise from kinetic processes. It can arise from turbulence in this region here, and I'm not going to talk about this because I don't have time. In the end, uh, reconnection turns out to be fast, which is consistent with the observations. The inflow velocities come out to be about a tenth of the alphane speed. So you've got outflow at the alphane speed and inflow at around a tenth of the alphane speed. So here's a picture of what, uh, from a PIC simulation for electron-proton reconnection. And this is the out-of-plane current. So you get, you've got plasma flowing, magnetic field lines flowing in, flowing in. There is an electric field pointing in and out of the page that drives a current. And so you've got, you form these characteristic current layers. And to have fast reconnection, you really need a short current layer 
because otherwise, if you have a very long current layer, you have this huge nozzle, and that inhibits the flow. So you want to have short current layers, and that leads to fast reconnection, and that's what you see in kinetic models. Okay, so that was for an electron-proton plasma. If you go and you look at pair and relativistic reconnection, uh, you find that pair reconnection is also fast. Uh, here's a picture of what it might look like. Um, the exhaust region becomes, the exhaust region, which is this region here of the outflow jet, becomes highly turbulent. There's an instability driven by the anisotropy and the pressure uh, that produces this turbulence. And then you can have relativistic reconnection when b squared over 4 pi mn c squared is greater than 1. And in that case, you get outflow jets which are relativistic. And it looks something like this. The outflow gamma factor is approximately the square root of sigma. Again, this is sigma greater than 1. And these tend to be pointing flux dominated. Even if you have a very small, so what happens is even if you have a small guide field, you compress that guide field and you don't heat a lot of plasma here, you wind up with a relativistic pointing flux dominated outflow jet. And I'm sure some of the other speakers are going to talk about the relativistic case a little bit more than I have here. Okay, so I'm going to go through and now talk about particle acceleration during reconnection. And I'm going to use the solar flare problem as a paradigm because we know a lot about that and we know from the failures we've had in trying to explain those observations what can go wrong. Okay, so in flares you have um, electron, electrons to MeVs and ions up to GeVs. And most important is a significant fraction of the released magnetic energy goes into the form of energetic electrons and ions. A large fraction goes into the energetic component of electrons and ions. It's not a small fraction. It's a large fraction. So why is the conversion efficiency so high? And then there's the numbers problem. Very large numbers of electrons undergo acceleration, and that becomes a challenge to explain. Also, they see a correlation between greater than 300 keV electrons and greater than 30 MeV ions, implying that there's a common acceleration mechanism. They're, it's not like A is accelerating electrons and B is accelerating ions. They seem to be linked. Here's a typical spectrum. This is the photon fluxes that they see. It's a log-log plot. And inverting this tends to give you often split power law solutions. This one is a very hard spectrum with a spectral index of uh, minus 1.5. Okay, so here's a very interesting and important observation. Um, it's usually very hard to see where the flare energy is actually released. And the reason is because typically you get energetic electrons high in the corona, it comes down and hits the, photo, the chromosphere and the instrument gets blinded by what's going on down here. So you can't see what's going on up here. However, this is a so-called over-the-limb event in which the foot points were down below the edge of the sun. And they could actually see what's going on high in the corona with both radio emission and X-ray emission from the RESI spacecraft. And what they concluded by looking at this is that number first thing, is that all electrons in the flaring reagent become part of the energetic component. Okay, all of the electrons become part of the energetic component. Not just a small tail, all of the electrons. Second thing is that the pressure of the energetic electrons approaches that of the magnetic field. So the electrons get heated until their pressure is comparable to the magnetic field pressure. Now for the corona, that's surprising because normally you consider the corona a low beta medium. The pressure is much less than the magnetic field energy. And yet this is so extraordinarily efficient acceleration of particles that the electron energetic component is comparable to the magnetic pressure. Okay, so let's start talking about mechanisms. So, much of the work on particle acceleration and reconnection has focused on the role of paraelectric fields around the X-line. 
Okay, so remember, flux is coming in here, it's coming in here. Moving flux creates an electric field which is out of the plane and that drives current and that can drive energetic particles. And this is a plot of that current and you can see the black lines. The black lines are where there's large current and that's where you have a large paraelectric field. Okay. However, what you can see is that there's not black throughout the entire domain. It's in these localized regions, these narrow layers. And those narrow layers have characteristic scales of order of the electron's skin depth. And you can see they map separatrices. This is a magnetic separatrix here. Okay, so here's the problem. We're doing particle and cell simulations. It's hard to do particle and cell simulations and you can't make them big enough. And so there's a scale separation problem. And the problem is that if you have small simulation domains, you overemphasize the role of E parallel. If you go to the real system, for example in flares, um, the skin depth is about 10 centimeters, the macro scale is 10 to the fourth kilometers. So imagine doing this simulation where this is 10 to the sixth or something times this narrow layer thickness. And you see the problem that we've got. And so these simulations tend to overstate the role of the paraelectric field. Okay. And this causes problems because if you look, for example, at reconnection in the sun, in the flare problem, you've got this system which is 10 to the fourth to 10 to the fifth kilometers in scale. Um, if you imagine a single X line here with paraelectric fields along separatrices and you're trying to produce 10 to the 37 electrons per second and you ask, well, here's a paraelectric field accelerating electrons down here. How much current would those electrons produce? They would produce magnetic fields of order 10 to the ninth Gauss. So it just does not work. Paraelectric fields producing very large numbers of electrons simply doesn't work. Um, the numbers don't work. And the further point is that the, uh, the paraelectric fields are shorted out except in a narrow region around the X line. Furthermore, if you go back to the picture I showed you of magnetic reconnection, where is the magnetic energy released? The magnetic energy released as, as these stressed field lines relax their tension and flow out from the X line. The energy is not released at the X line proper. That's where you get the magnetic field lines get broken, but the energy you release occurs downstream, not at the X line. Okay. The X line is a region of negligible volume. You simply cannot explain all the energetic particles and flares with a model based on particle acceleration in this region here. It just doesn't work. So the bottom line is the, the single X line model simply doesn't work to explain what's going on in flares. Okay. Unfortunately you can't see this movie. But this is a wonderful movie. You can't normally see where reconnection is occurring in the high corona because there are so few particles up there. But what you can see is if you look at this picture you can see these little black regions here. If you saw the movie, what you'd see is hundreds of these black regions coming down here. There's a, there's a reconnection going on up here and there's hundreds of structures coming down, raining on top of this bright region here. These are called super arcade downflows. They're now considered very typical. There's hundreds of these things and this suggests that the single X-line picture of flares doesn't work. In fact, there are many, many reconnection events going on simultaneously. Okay, and so people have started looking at multi X line, multi magnetic island reconnection. I've got five minutes left. Wow. Okay. A um, bunch of authors. Okay, so let me, let me tell you then what. So I'm arguing that E parallel is not what it is. Um, I'm arguing what it is in fact something else which is a magnetic slingshot. So uh, imagine a bent field line here that wants to relax by moving to the right with some velocity. 
This is basically a magnetic slingshot. You wind up shortening magnetic field lines as you do this. And you can write down an equation for the magnetic energy. It's given by the curvature dot into the Z cross B drift. Curvature vector is pointing to the right. And then if you, so that's how magnetic fields release their energy. How do particles gain energy? Through the, sl the same slingshot mechanism. Here it is here. And so what happens? Particles come zipping in around the corner here, but that field line is moving to the right. So as they do that, it's like a slingshot effect. So particles come in, then they get slingshotted around. And you can write down the, the, part of, the rate of particle energy gain like that. Um, in the 2D limit, this becomes very simple to understand. Imagine you have a magnetic island here, and uh, the ends of this are flowing in at the Alfaian speed, and so a particle bounces around in here. Every time it goes around the corner, it undergoes a Fermi reflection and gains energy, and you can calculate the rate of energy gain. It goes into the parallel velocity of particles, and the rate of energy gain is the same for electrons and protons. So we've been studying this kind of process, in, and other people have also, in multi x line reconnection simulations. Um, and you get particle spectra. Um, this is a log linear plot, so these are not power laws. But what you can immediately see is uh, initially and final, this is with a bunch of seed particles. Um, the particles with most energy gain more energy, so the rate of energy gain is proportional to the energy. That means it looks like a Fermi-like process, and we see that by looking at trajectories of particles. So here's an example of an electron from this simulation. In the movie, you can see it bouncing back and forth. So it bounces back and forth and climbs up in energy and uh, energy gain each time you undergo a bounce here. So Fermi acceleration in contracting and merging islands is what we see in the simulations. Um, you said five minutes, but it's now only 11.20, so I'm confused. So it's 20 plus five. So like two more speaking in English. OK. OK, so um, particle acceleration increases the parallel velocity of the particles. That means their parallel pressure goes up. And there's this thing called the Weibel instability, which goes unstable if there's too much pressure on anisotropy. And that's what you see here. All these little kinks in here um, are due to the Weibel instability. And so that's an important feedback mechanism. Um, and why is the Weibel, important, Weibel instability important? If you look at the propagation of an Alfane wave, which is the wave that involves bent field lines, <coughs> It looks like this. This is the Weibel instability threshold. So when you hit the Weibel threshold, the frequency of an Alfane wave goes to zero. What does that mean? That means that there's no more magnetic tension in a field line when you hit this Weibel threshold. So this is the important feedback of energetic particles on magnetic fields. They create anisotropy. They eliminate the tension in field lines. And that shuts down the reconnection process. So that that's the key feedback me mechanism for energetic particles on um, magnetic reconnection. And this is crucial to try to understand the spectra. So let's see, I'm running out of time. So let me just say that one of the mysteries we had when we started looking at try and trying to understand and create a transport equation for energetic particles during reconnection was that the Parker transport equation, which has been used to understand shocks for a long period of time simply doesn't work for magnetic reconnection. And the reason is because to lowest order, when you, go, when you have a contracting island like this, it's nearly incompressible. And the Parker transport equation tells you that um, the energy gain comes from the compression term. And so in the absence of this term, there is no um, energy gain according to Parker's equation. And the problem is that Parker's equation assumes strong scattering. And that doesn't work for reconnection. And so we started doing is looking at what happens when you have either contracting or merging magnetic islands. 
And uh, so as I mentioned earlier, there's two con couple of conservation laws. One is the flux and the other is the area. So if you're looking at how islands merge, but there's also particle conservation laws. One is the magnetic moment, V perp squared over B, and B goes down during, the re during this merging process so that V perp squared go down, so the perpendicular pressure actually goes down, while the field lines get shortened and therefore the parallel action, V parallel times L, uh, which is an invariant, L goes down, so V parallel goes up. So during reconnection, you have a drop in, in the perpendicular energy and a gain in the parallel energy. And you can calculate the rate of that, to which that happens during the merging of two islands like this. And you notice if you add up these two energies, these two exactly cancel if you have a purely isotropic plasma. So magnetic reconnection generates and isotropy, and that's crucial for exploring how particle energy gain takes place. So you can take those rates and you can immediately write down a general equation for particle energy gain with anisotropy during reconnection, and that's what you get. And this is the driver where you get energy gain, and the perpendicular energy gives you loss. Um, and this is a very beautiful equation. In my mind, it's an equidimensional equation, has no intrinsic scale, and that means you get power law solutions, which you can calculate. And you can include the feedback due to anisotropy, which is what I mentioned before. This is the important feedback. And uh, you can calculate solutions for this essentially exactly, <clears throat> and you get the very interesting results in the strong drive limit when you include feedback from the fire hose, you find basically a universal spectral index of e to the minus 1.5. That's for the non-relativistic case. And for the relativistic case, it's e to the minus 2. And I'm running out of time here. So the speakers, the organizers told me to be um, uh, controversial. So here's my controversial statement. What is the upper limit that you can get from particle acceleration during reconnection? And so I started trying to think about this and getting ready for this meeting. And what really seems to be an upper limit in my mind is to compare the energy gain during the slingshot and the particle radiation you get as that particle goes around that curved field line. If the radi since the radiation goes like gamma to the fourth and the slingshot energy gain goes like gamma, at some point the radiation is going to win and you can write down an upper limit on the relativistic factor during reconnection. This is the scale size of the magnetic field and this is the classical electron radius. So this is the, seems to me the most intrinsic upper limit you can, you can get from looking at particle energy gain during reconnection. Yeah, I was just wondering if you could comment on uh, what, what is the state of the art for the three-dimensional version of the kinetic simulations that you've been using? I didn't plant this question, did I? <laughs> okay, so we're, we're in the midst of trying to look at uh, PIC simulations and 3D reconnection and the associated particle acceleration. And um, it's a very challenging problem. Um, for obvious reasons, and so, but we're, we're, so we're trying to figure out, for example, I showed you in a contracting island how particles get accelerated. So we're looking at the generalization of that to a full 3D system where the orbits are not going to close. And so we're evaluating that right now to try to figure out how to describe that and trying to generalize that equation, um, that transport-like equation to the full 3D system. And so what you can see is that field lines Orbits of particles don't simply close now, they wander through magnetic islands, so they undergo contraction and then they escape. And um, how big can we make our computer simulations? That really is what's going on now. Thank you. <laughs>